All right, hello everybody. So we're continuing on with the origins of the Cold War. Um, it would become known as the Cold War later and the historians have debated ever since, when does it exactly begin? A lot of people say, you know, the second that the Germans and Japanese surrendered in 1945, the world was reoriented, reordered, and right then the lines were drawn. Other people say, you know, Actually, the alliance didn't really break down. Uh, there weren't really outward signs of that until 1947, when you saw really public statements made by both sides, Stalin and Truman, very antagonistic towards the other. The Truman Doctrine is announced, the Marshall Plan is announced in 47. That might be a moment. Some people say it's not until the Korean War in 1950. Some historians go all the way back to 1918, when the US invaded the Soviet Union to reverse the Russian Revolution. Whenever it began, Gens, uh, which is a bit nebulous and, and uh, normative. It depends on what you believe. Um, certainly, it, it, it's an event that occurs and it becomes the foundation of our foreign policy until 1989 when the Soviet Union collapsed. So last time we left off, uh, we had just talked about the elections in Italy that uh, the CIA managed to rig, which was pretty impressive. Um, countries try this nowadays. You guys probably remember that uh, Hillary Clinton got her emails hacked in uh, the 2016 campaign and the Russian government was actively trying to aid the Trump campaign. Uh, there was a whole investigation. It, it's clear the Trump campaign wasn't working uh, in lockstep with uh, the Russian government for sure. But um, governments try this all the time. They try to flex their muscles in a way to change governments in other parts of the world that are more amenable to them. And the US is no different. It raises a lot of moral questions. Like if we are a democracy and we're trying to promote democratic values across the world, is it right for us to meddle in other countries' affairs? Well, some people thought there was an exception for communism, that it was such an evil, insidious, awful form of government. And by the way, we fought and bled and died to liberate Italy and France and Belgium. Shouldn't we be able to say, nope, this government is just not acceptable to us. We want democracy and freedom, but there's certain forms of government where if they were democratically elected, then they would dismantle the system. Um, plus, it would just be antithetical to our uh, interests. We would be asked to leave these co the countries, our military bases, we would lose trade partners, we'd lose an ally. And we didn't wanna do that. It'd be so much easier just to put our thumb on the scale and, and change this election without anyone knowing, and we did. Now, um, the next major Cold War event that will occur is the Berlin blockade. So this is a big struggle over the currency. Believe it or not, we're at three years. Um, we're talking about you know May, June, 1948. We're at three years after the end of World War II. The Nuremberg trials are all over. Um, Marshall Plan aid is flowing in. The rubble is slowly getting cleared away. The schools have reopened. Um, the Germans do not quite have their own government yet, but they have sort of a provisional government. They're writing a constitution or rather to, It'd be more correct to say we are writing it for them. Um, but there's still this hope that we might reunify Germany. We want to see it reunified, rearmed, democratic, free, rich, able to trade, invest in, you know, buy from the United States. That's the last thing the Soviets want. They want the Germans to be weak, divided, impotent, so that Germany can't threaten the Soviet Union anymore. And so these negotiations had basically broken down. And it there was almost at this point the recognition that hey you do what you want in your zone of control where your soldiers are and we'll do what we want in our zone of control that was more of a tacit understanding it, it, it hadn't become codified yet but we're heading in that direction and the berlin blockade will cement that so um the issue is that the u.s basically said in order for marshall plan aid to be effective we need the germans to have their own currency we can't be having them trade lucky strike cigarettes. We need a modern banking system. And that all is predicated on a currency regime, right? That uh, uh, other Western countries had done this already because they were weak uh, economically, militarily, et cetera, because we were so strong and we had half the world's gold reserves because of cash and carry. Um, we tied our currency to the dollar. Um, you could trade in $32 for one ounce of gold 
and that price would not fluctuate. It would be pegged essentially, and the government would reevaluate it, you know, every once in a while and allow it to reestablish. But um, foreign currencies of countries that allied to us would have their currency uh, pegged to ours, which was pegged to the dollar. Now, the US really did a gracious thing here. They forbade, meaning they banned, they abolished the ability of Americans to actually purchase gold because we knew there wasn't enough gold in the world and in our reserves to back up all the dollars that were in circulation. So we allowed foreigners to tie their currency to gold. So that meant if there was a panic, if there was like a collapse in a currency, like a hyperinflation, like what happened in Germany and led to Hitler, those countries could always go and take their currency, buy US dollars, and then buy gold. So it would stabilize it. If people knew deep down that they could do that in a crisis, then they wouldn't do it to begin with. They would just keep their own currency. But in order to do that, Americans had to be told, you're just gonna have to use the dollars. You cannot buy gold with it, which was rather extraordinary and, and quite an abridgment of freedom. But Americans were told that until 1973, Americans could not buy gold like in bars or anything like that. So um, we were not supposed to issue a currency for West Germany. We were supposed to unify the country and then establish it throughout. Stalin got very mad when we started setting up the D-mark or the Deutschmark in West Germany, tying it to the dollar. Money started to flow. Marshall Plan 8 and Stalin went through the roof. He kept saying, take that currency out and let's go back to the negotiating table. We said, make us. And so he implemented a a blockade on the western half of Berlin. So this is before there was the wall around Berlin. But let's go back to our map so that you guys can understand this, right? So these are the three western allied zones, British, French, and American. They would be unified by 1948 under kind of a central control, but there's no elected parliament or anything like that yet. The Soviet zone in red, very appropriately here. But then you get the Western half of Berlin. Berlin's the prize, it's the biggest city. It would be like New York for America, right? And because it's not right in the middle of the country, the Russians were actually good to their word. They allowed British, French, and American troops to occupy the Western half of Berlin. And so Stalin said, get out. And we said, no, we're not gonna get out. And he said, we'll take the currency out. We said, no. So he shut down all roads, all highways, all railways, um, shut off the electricity because all the power plants for the western half of Berlin were in the Soviet sector. And he just said, I'm going to starve these people out until they get rid of that currency. And so Truman had an emergency meeting of his cabinet. And he was given kind of conflicting advice. Some advisors just said, you know, this is insane. We're staring down the barrel of World War III. And it's not all that important to hold on to the Western half of Berlin. Why don't we just give Stalin what he wants, either take out the currency or just you know give up Berlin. Other people felt we can't give into a tyrant. This is the 10 year anniversary of, of the Munich agreement. The whole Western world sold out Czechoslovakia. It didn't save the peace. We still had to fight World War II and we were selling out an ally that would have fought valiantly and bravely for us. The Czechs are great munitions makers, right? A lot of people don't know that, but the AK-47 was not a Soviet or a Russian made weapon. It was, it was a Czech weapon. And so the idea was that we could not sell out the Berliners, the Western half of the city, that we would have to stand by them. But how are you going? Some people were very belligerent. Some advisors were telling Truman, he had, the uh, Russian tanks that were blocking the roads, just brush them aside, fire at them. They're cowards, they'll just run away. Truman knew that this was going to spark World War III, that the Soviets would retaliate by just rolling into Berlin. And Berlin was an indefensible. It was a city deep inside Soviet territory, completely surrounded on four sides. They could have never been able to hold out. Maybe two hours was as long as they could hold out, then they'd be brutally crushed. And so finally, Truman came up with the idea of an airlift. It would be the least provocative way to supply Berlin. Now, when this was suggested, most of the logicians, you know, people that are very smart uh, about supplying cities and such, laughed at this. No city in human history had ever survived a blockade by air. It was thought you could only hold out for a couple of weeks. You know, you would, planes are the least efficient way to supply anything. Still to this day, ships are the best way. Ships are the slowest, but you can make them bigger than anything else. 
Then on land, either train or truck is fairly efficient. The least is airplane because by their very nature, airplanes have to be relatively light to get off the ground, and they're not as big as these use ocean going uh, vessels. But it was the only option that was there. So Truman started ordering planes, passenger planes, to take off from all over Western Germany and land in West Berlin at Tempelhof Air Force Base, unload all their cargo, and then turn around and take off and refuel and, and you know get more goods, basically. Again, nobody thought that this was sustainable in the long run. Most people just said, this is not even going to work. We either have to, we have need a permanent solution, either surrender Berlin, get take out the currency, or just go to war. Truman kept his cool, kept the airlift going for 11 months, from June of 48 to May of 49. For 330 days, he kept it going. And West Berlin survived. Uh, again, Americans, um, at least in the past, we've been problem solvers. We're given these unbelievably difficult problems like uh, the Erie Canal, right? How can we make a canal 364 miles long when the longest one in the world is 10 miles long, right? How are we going to blow apart mountains? And, and we did it, right? Uh, how are we going to land people on the moon? And, you know, we did it. Similarly, most people just said, how could we supply the city that's deep inside another sector? How can we do that? Well, we did it using, you know, our smarts, our, our logistical uh, organizational skills. Um, every 45 seconds at the height of the airlift, it wasn't like this on day one, but after a few months at the height of the airlift, a plane landed in West Berlin at Tempelhof Air Force Base every 45 seconds. And like the Indy 500, these pit crews would roll out on the tarmac, unload everything in a few seconds, and then the plane would just turn around and take off and go land and get fully laden again and just go back. So there's streams of planes just going day and night. Now the ball is in Stalin's court. Are you really gonna shoot down civilian aircraft that you know are unarmed and have no weapons whatsoever? He wasn't because then World War III would be his fault. And there was really no way to escalate beyond that point except for actual war, like shooting down one of these planes. So he did not. A lot of Soviet aircraft would buzz these planes or fly close to them and try to scare them off, but they never attacked because then the whole world would turn against Joseph Stalin. The Berlin blockade continues. Truman gets a lot of credit for it because he was strong, but he was also calm. He didn't precipitate World War III, but he also didn't cave into the Soviets, which was a wonderful thing, built back his reputation. In July, Truman did a very, very controversial thing. Folks, remember that this is the era where Jackie Robinson first started in baseball just the year prior in 1947. Um, it's very interesting that the two All-American institutions that became the first to be integrated were baseball and the Army, which are not very democratic institutions. Baseball is a business, the military, you know, literally you give a lot of your freedom away when you join, yet those were integrated first. And here's why because the president's commander in chief and he can in certain areas just snap his fingers and make changes happen. You can't do that with congressional bills. You have to go through and make laws and negotiate. But when you're commander in chief, you can just reorganize the army however you want, which is why, you know, uh, President Clinton changed the policy towards gays in the military to don't ask, don't tell. Um, Obama changed it to you can serve openly. There's talk about if you're uh, transgender, can you serve in, in the military? And there was a, a ban on transgender people under the uh, Trump administration. We'll see if that gets reversed. Whatever you think about these policies, clearly the president has much more latitude with the military. So he just did this. There was a commission that started investigating this issue right when the war ended. And this commission essentially said, this is the week soft underbelly of American democracy. We are, we've had this fine tradition going back to 1776. Most other countries lapsed into totalitarianism in the 20th century. We held on to it. We're the light of the world. And this is the easiest way to criticize it and delegitimize it. And Stalin was doing that. He was saying, don't believe the hype that America is the land of the free and the home of the brave. Look at races. It was the easiest thing you could point to. And so this commission said, this is going to take generations. It's going to take decades to solve this problem, but every journey starts with the first step. 
And this is what you can do. And so Truman did it, which was risky in an election year. He was running for election in 48. Remember, he was not elected president in 44. FDR was. He was elected vice president. He really was not elected in his own right. And uh, this was a very brave thing to do. And he did it. Now, looking back, you'd say, well, it's just the military. It's like less than 1% of the population. Sure, but it's the all-American institution, right? Notice these debates we have about the flag. I always find it very curious when many people say, well, if you don't stand for the flag, you're dishonoring the troops. And I feel like, is the flag just the property of the military? Is that who we are in America? Remember that we've always had up to World War II a very anti-militaristic stance, meaning the military is wonderful, but we shouldn't have a big standing army and we shouldn't have you know, the military have a bigger say than the civilians in, in, in America. Um, I always kind of found that argument a bit curious. I said, well, you know, did the troops deserve, uh, you know, different treatment than the rest of America? Aren't we all equal? It seemed kind of a weird argument to me. But nonetheless, uh, the military is highly respected in America. One of these institutions that's still like the media has no respect, the Congress has no respect, uh, you know, nothing in, in society has any respect from the population anymore, except the military. It's the one agency you still can't openly criticize. And so um, in July, Truman integrated it. And that was the signal that this all American institutions being integrated, everything else is going to come soon. It was sort of, people could see the handwriting on the walls, which is why when the Democrats had their convention the next month, um, Truman decided that uh, he would run again. He won the primary there. And the Dixiecrats, the Southern hardcore segregationists, thought, well, Truman's one of us. He's from Missouri. He's a good old boy from the South. Missouri was a slave state. And when he did this, they just said, well, he's not one of us. And so Strom Thurmond, Senator from South Carolina, of course it would be South Carolina, right? First to secede, a okay, prototypical slave state and segregationist state. This gentleman broke with the party and ran as a third party candidate. Now, you guys should probably know from history from 1824 when Andrew Jackson ran against Henry Clay and uh, John Quincy Adams in 1912, when Woodrow Wilson ran against not only Taft, but Roosevelt as well. This splits the vote and your opponent wins. So everyone thought when the Dixiecrats bolted and left the convention and made their own party, everyone thought, well, that's the end of it, right? Truman is going to lose. There's no way the Democrats can win. Not only was there uh, a bolting on the right, there was a fracturing on the left. Some... Uh, hardcore liberals in the Democratic Party uh, did not trust Truman on the Cold War. They thought he was being dangerous with the Berlin blockade. They thought the Marshall Plan was way too expensive. They were sort of neo-isolationists. They, they kind of wanted to retreat from Europe and forget about everything again. And they had kind of a soft spot in their hearts for the Soviet Union. Um, now, these people weren't all bad or all naive. Many of them had great ideas. Henry Wallace was their leader. Remember, he was Secretary of Agriculture. He, he was Vice President up till 1944. And he felt he kind of got cheated out of the presidency because he got dumped and Truman becomes Vice President and then President. And Henry Wallace just felt this hick from Missouri who doesn't have a college education as the president. I'm smarter than him. So Wallace got upset and formed his own party known as the Progressive Party. We would call it today like a Democratic Socialist Party. He was calling for more integration and desegregation. He was calling for um, socialized medicine, all these kind of democratic welfare programs. And he was basically saying, let the Soviets have Europe. Let's just withdraw. We're being way too provocative over West Germany or West Berlin. And it's got nothing to do with us, right? The Monroe Doctrine always said, we go to war over things in our hemisphere, not what's going on over there. And so... Um, everyone thought Truman's going to lose. He's got the left wing breaking off from his party and the right wing. There's just no way he can win. And sure enough, he pulled it off. The Republican candidate, Thomas Dewey, governor of New York, he had run against FDR in 1944. He had lost, but he had come closer than anyone else. Um, Herbert Hoover got stomped in 1932. Alf Landon got it even worse in 36. Wendell Wilkie did a little bit better in 40, and Thomas Dewey came pretty, people forget this. They just say, oh, Roosevelt was elected four times. Yeah, he was, but he was, I don't want to say losing popularity, but by 1944, the depression was over. The war was nearly over, and many people started saying, you know, let's go back to the good old days when we didn't need massive New Deal programs and all that stuff, and people grew a bit more conservative. Everyone thought, every single newspaper in America did scientific polling, 
and they all predicted that Truman was going to lose and that Dewey would win. So much so that the Chicago Tribune printed millions of copies of this edition the night of the election before the results had fully come in. They were so certain Dewey was going to win and they wanted to scoop everyone else on the story that they printed this newspaper. And sure enough, early in the morning, two, three in the morning, results from California and the West Coast came in for Truman and Truman pulled it out. This is a very famous picture, one of the most famous in political history, uh, and a lot of people don't understand it. That's a picture of Harry Truman, and what he's doing is holding up this newspaper that says, Dewey defeats Truman, as if to say, you guys counted me out, you didn't think I could do it, but I won anyway. And he did it. It was a great moment. He was sort of saying, you know, this is a rag. It's a piece of garbage, right? I wouldn't blow my nose into it because they all went on the line and said that Dewey was going to win and I beat him. So Truman's gloating a little bit there. It's a great success story. This guy who, again, was uh, no elite person. He came from, you know, I wouldn't say poverty, but very meager uh, backgrounds. And he, through sheer will and determination and luck, a lot of luck, became president of the United States, elected in his own right. The Democrats retook Congress. And so Truman said, I'm back. I'm going to get a full four-year term with a friendly Congress. Sky's the limit. This is going to be great. And really, the irony here is that this is probably the worst phase of Truman's presidency. 46 was bad, but 47, 48, he built his reputation back. He got reelected. 49 and onward are pretty problematical, even with the Democratic Congress. So here's what happens in 49. So first... Truman comes in with a huge agenda. He says, I want to pass the fair deal. What on earth is the fair deal? Um, the fair deal is, uh, as you might imagine, kind of like the New Deal. It would be a, a, an array of government programs uh, combating poverty, et cetera, et cetera. He had big plans. He wanted to have like a socialized you know, medicine program in America. He wanted uh, an anti-lynching law because lynching was still going on in America in the 40s and often completely unpunished. Uh, it was a liberal's dream, basically. He wasn't able to get hardly anything passed because almost every conversation would grind to a halt when white Southerners would ask the question, are Black people going to benefit from this program? And if they were, then white Southerners were against it. Let's have an increase in you know, the minimum wage or social security or any kind of program. Are black people gonna benefit? Probably, no, we don't like that. Or let's see if we can exclude them from that program. One thing I didn't mention is in 1935 when social security passed, there were exceptions. Um, domestic workers, that is maids, butlers, people like that, and agricultural workers would not get social security. So who did that mean? That meant Black people and Hispanic people, Hispanic people in California, New Mexico, Arizona, who do a lot of agricultural labor. And it means Black people picking cotton in the South are not going to benefit from this because of racism. What Truman was able to get passed through was a modest increase in the minimum wage. I forget exactly what it was, but I think it was like 75 cents and he got it raised to a dollar. There's debate now about, you know, the stimulus bill that went through should have $15 minimum wage been attached to it. It was not. Um, and, you know, there's debate, should we have a minimum wage? What should it be? This was a modest raise in it. Social security was expanded um, to encompass other people, which was good. And housing, the FHA, the Federal Housing Act was passed in 1949. And I underline this one because this is the most important part of the fair deal. And in all honesty, this is one of the most important laws ever passed, not only in our country, but in the history of the world. It, it was extraordinary. It's up there with the Homestead Act, and it was very similar to the Homestead Act and what it did, which was basically to lift people out of poverty and change their station in life. What was not passed was an anti-lynching law. We would not get an anti-lynching law from the federal government until the 1960s, and an anti-poll tax. This commission that Truman, you know, had me uh, said the biggest barrier to African-Americans voting is that there's this poll tax. There's a five, 10, $15 poll tax in most Southern states, which prevented not only African-Americans from voting, but pretty much poor whites too. I mean, some states like Virginia, uh, in the 1924 presidential race, Virginia had a 4% voter turnout, which me meant that only upper middle class and wealthy white people voted. And that was it, which is, that's not a democracy. That's not representative of the population as a whole. 
But that's the way it was. That was still Jim Crow. So let's talk about housing because this is hugely, hugely important. Now, here's what I did. This gets very technical and it gets very uh, granular in the details. So don't try not to get lost in that. But basically, many libertarians believe that government can't help, it can only hurt. This is not true. Now, government can hurt the economy in a lot of ways, but it's been demonstrated that government can actually do wonderful things to improve an economy, right? Look at the Pure Food and Drug Act, look at the Meat Inspection Act, look at the uh, Homestead Act, and look at this law, and look at the Emergency Banking Act that FDR passed. Um, here's what this does. So prior to the 50s, this is passed in, you know, the middle of 1949. It doesn't really get going until the 50s. Prior to the 50s, most Americans did not own their own homes. They rented, just like most Europeans do today. A lot of people don't know this, and liberals often will look at Europe and go, oh my god, Europe's so amazing. Look at all these liberal social welfare programs. Well, they're right about a lot of them, but Europeans, by and large, rent. They rent apartments. They're urbanized. They live in very crowded cities, and they have small little apartments, and they don't own. They rent. So there's very interesting uh, perception of Americans and particularly American men. And that's that we're proud of our homes. We know how to fix them up. We're handy. We go to Home Depot every single weekend, right? This is not me. I am the least handy person around. Do not ask me for any help around the house. I don't know how to fix anything. But that's the perception that many people have because two thirds of Americans own their own home. To this day, Europeans only about a one, one third of them do. Um, we used to be much more like Europe in that sense is that we rented by and large um, because Banks don't like risk. If you wanted a mortgage, you would have to put 50% down of the value of the home, finance or borrow the other 50%, and usually pay it off in 10 to 15 years, which meant that this was out of the reach for almost anyone who was an average American or a poor American. Um, so let's look at housing prices in, uh, in the Millican area, right? My wife and I, we live in Cyprus. We have a townhouse. It's nice, but it's not fantastic or anything. We would love to move to Los Altos, or Lakewood, you know, nice little home, uh, you know, two or three bedroom, two bathroom, swimming pool, um, you know, probably 1,250 to 1,500 square feet, nice, nice yard. The house I just described would be probably $800,000 in Los Altos or Lakewood or in that area. East Long Beach, basically. Now, um, you won't insult me, but I want to ask you, do you think that I have $400,000 cash in my bank account right now to put down as a down payment? Don't think too hard. Nobody I know has that kind of money. Uh, if I did have that money, quite frankly, I wouldn't be teaching at Millican High School. I, I would be retired, you know, if I had 400 grand just in cash in a bank account somewhere. No one has that kind of money. Um, so I wouldn't be able to own my own home. I would just be renting in an apartment. Now, why is it nice to own your own home? It's not perfect. There's a lot of downsides to it. There's a lot of risk and liability, right? If a tree branch, you know, falls off a tree and, and you know, caves in your roof and everything and you don't have insurance, well, you just bought yourself an $80,000 repair bill, right? You have to refinance your house basically just to fix it. So owning a home does come with risk, but here's why, particularly in California, it's so great. When you buy a home, it's X, and then it increases in value, and the retirement plan many people I know have is they sell their home when they retire, they then cash it out, and you could move to Idaho where homes are very cheap, right? If you sold your $800,000 home in Long Beach when you're 65, you could move to Idaho, buy one for $100,000, buy a mansion, and you could live like a king or a queen for the rest of your life. It's basically our retirement program, that and social security or your pension program from wherever you work. And it's very successful. You can refinance your home to get the equity out of it, to put your kids through college, to finance a business, to, to get you out of trouble. It's great, it's, it's the root out of the working class into the middle class in America. That's how you do it is you buy a home, basically. Because the government comes in now, this is what the FHA did. The government wants people to buy homes um, because they want America to be a richer country. They want people to lift themselves out of poverty. They, and they know that when you are a homeowner, you're less likely to commit crimes. 
um, you're more likely to be a serious person, settle down, get married, and have stability in the country. So the government creates an agency, which is basically Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They're these big banks, essentially, that the US government creates. And they go out and they buy up all the mortgages that the banks have loaned, and they bundle them together where there's less risk. And when you do that, then you can tell the banks, you can take on a little more risk, right? Why wouldn't the banks want a 30-year loan and only 10% down? It's very risky. 30 years, what if you lose your job? What if you die? What if, you know, you? it's way too expensive and too risky. And so the banks won't do it on their own. But when the government says, we'll buy up all those mortgages and the banks say, well, that's fine then. We won't have any of the risk. Sure, we will gladly um, start lending out more money. And so the government told the banks, here's the stipulations. We want people to be able to put 10% down. Now, 80 grand is still a lot of money, but it's a lot easier to attain than um, <clears throat> 400 grand, right? Now, I do not have 80 grand in cash, but what I have is the equity in my home. I bought my home, my townhouse, in 2009 when the market had collapsed and it was pretty affordable. It was $360,000 at that time. I just refinanced my home to get the payment down last summer. And when you refinance it, you get assessed and they you know, evaluate your home. It's about $540,000 now. It's, it's essentially almost $200,000 more than when I bought it for. Now I've paid down a little bit of the principal of the debt that I had, but most of that value that I'm holding is just an appreciation. It's because I bought something that went up in value and, and real estate in California, always tends to go up because there's housing crisis here. Everybody wants to live here and there's not enough housing. We can't build it fast enough because there's all these regulations. So it's a great investment. And so this is the unleashing of the suburbs. After this law was passed, the suburbs exploded all throughout America. Lakewood being one of the first ones. In a matter of two, three years, most of the housing in Los Altos and Lakewood were all built up through these kind of loans that average everyday people could get, particularly because there's 16 and a half million veterans who have the GI Bill who can get low interest loans under these new fair terms. It was wonderful. However, there is a very ugly dark side of this law, which is uh, what became to be known as redlining. So here's the way redlining works. The bank uh, wants to get in on this and wants to loan money to, to people. The government wants it to happen, but there's still risk involved. So they want to minimize risk uh, in areas where homes don't retain their value or they might go down in value. So what areas are those? Those are areas where the schools aren't very good, where the crime rate's much higher, where the government services aren't very, you know, you call the cops and they don't show up for a day, you know, the garbage collection's not very good. Where are those neighborhoods? Those neighborhoods are in ghettos and in the inner cities all over America. They're in black neighborhoods, basically, uh, in 1949 and 1950. And so the government came in and literally would color code cities. And they'd show like huge maps, like a map that took up the whole wall of a bank. They'd have it street by street. And if it was shaded green, that meant if you're loaning money to someone who's buying in that neighborhood, we will back it up, give them the good 10% down 30 year mortgage. If you're buying in this red area, more risk. So we're not gonna insure the loans. We're not gonna back it up. We're not gonna buy them. You loan if you want, but banks would then say, all right, well, we're gonna do the 50% down 10 or 15 year loan. So what that meant was most African American, nearly all could not enjoy the fruits of, of this bill. Here's why, because still in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s, it was not until the 70s that there was essentially segregation throughout the country, not just in the South, but in the North. So here's how this works. The South had what we would call de jure segregation, segregation by law. This is where you literally tell people, you drink here from this water fountain, you drink there from that. You go to this school, you go to that school. That's what the South would do. In the North, what they would do is they would allow homeowners associations to make CCNRs, right? These are covenants, contracts, and restrictions. So I live in a townhouse, so you move in and they say, all right, well, if you can't put a satellite dish on your home because that is tacky, it looks bad, and it decreases the value of everybody else's home in that area. And so um, when you moved into Lakewood, they have these CCNRs and they out and out said in there that if you own a home in Lakewood, if you're buying into this neighborhood and you sign a contract, 
you cannot rent to black people, you cannot sell to black people. And some of these were so restrictive, they wouldn't even allow you to rent or sell to certain white people like Jews or Catholics. Um, because people were racist, they just wanted to live amongst their own kind. And they honestly felt that if a black family moved in, everyone would move out and it would drive down housing values. And so this was allowed and encouraged and it increased segregation in the North. A fascinating study was done between two men and they were the same in every, they were both born to families who made the same amount. One was black, one was white. Um, they both were World War II veterans. They both got the GI Bill. They both went to college. They both had the same job. Upon the death of the white guy, he was $1 million richer in wealth than the black man, simply because of this law. Because the white guy got a government loan, got into a nice suburban area, made his 30 years of mortgage payments, and the home generated that much value over that time, the Black person couldn't get it. Because even in a poor neighborhood, still people don't have 50% to put down. And you say, okay, we'll move into the white neighborhood, move into Lakewood. You can't because of those CCNRs. No one would rent or sell to you. They just wouldn't. There's a really weird um, libertarian argument that many people have made, which is that Racism is stupid from an economic standpoint that the only color that matters is green. And if you let market forces just handle everything, business owners will rent to black people, sell to black people, hire black people, et cetera. We know that to be not true because even outside of the South where the law forbade you to do it in the North, there were no laws restricting it, but people just act irrationally about certain things. It's very, very bizarre, but it's true. Why would you not let Jackie Robinson into Major League Baseball? There are millions of Black fans that will now come to your ballpark and buy your jerseys and shell out money for tickets, et cetera. It's a win-win. Ir irrationality, just fear. It was segregation, racism is stupid. It's true, but the libertarians are wrong when they say businesses will just allow it. Businesses in the North, restaurants, hotels would not cater to Black patrons, even though their money was just as green as everybody else's. So you needed laws that would come in and change this, and this law only deepened it, and it was terrible. So um, what else happened in 1949? Switching gears and moving off of American you know, segregation and housing patterns, uh, we're into April with NATO. Um, NATO is going to be an alliance of all of Western Europe. Essentially, this, this is fascinating to me because the US does a complete 180. Remember that Washington's parting words to us in 1797, don't make any entangling alliances. What that means is don't make any alliance with any European nation, right? Like don't join the French or the British in an alliance against the other, because you'll just get dragged into war after war. There's all these ancient ethnic rivalries, monarchies in Europe, stay out of that, live in peace. And NATO, we decided to do exactly that. The feeling was that there's this huge threat. The Soviets would not demobilize their army and send it home. They had 10 million soldiers stationed in Eastern Europe. And we kept telling them, demobilize your army and send it home. And they kept telling us, well, uh, disarm your nuclear arsenal, get rid of your nuclear weapons, and we won't be so afraid. And we said, well, you demobilize your army first. And they said, no, you, uh, you denuclearize first. And we just could not come to an agreement. So the US said, all right, uh, we need to dissuade the Russians. So we're gonna build bomber bases all over Western Europe where the planes will be perpetually in the air, just circling. They can even refuel in the air just in case we get the warning that the Russians are moving on West Germany and on France. And then those bombers would go and retaliate against targets in the Soviet Union just a few hours later. Also, we would make an alliance with all these countries that if the Soviets ever did attack any other country, the whole of Europe, the whole of the free world would unite against them. And we got all of these countries to buy into it. That became NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is still an alliance today that the US is still the leader of. And today it's even extended to Eastern Europe because the Cold War is over and these countries don't like the Russians very much. In May, the Berlin blockade finally ended. Stalin uh, uh, allowed the roads to be reopened. He just looked terrible. There were these wonderful pictures, great propaganda pictures from Life and Time Magazine showing pilots literally dropping chocolate bars with like little miniature parachutes on them and German kids like grabbing them and just saying, ah, oh, Hershey chocolate tastes just like freedom, right? Little interviews with these kids saying, don't give up on us. The communists are trying to take our freedom away. And Stalin just looked terrible. The America looked like it was moving heaven and earth to feed a starving people. The Soviets looked like they were trying to starve little children, which they were. 
So Stalin gave up on it. The US said, all right, now that the blockade has been lifted, Germany had a constitution. We withdrew by and large. We'd still have military bases that we would lease with the permission of the West German government, but they had a parliament, they had a chancellor, they had their own country, they were up and running and they were part of NATO. A few months later, the Soviets explode their first atomic bomb. This would shock the world. Now it's quite interesting because right after we used the atomic bomb, in August of 45, most scientists were asked how long until the Soviets or some other country uh, is able to achieve it. And they gave them about four years. Exactly four years later, the Soviets exploded. And a lot of people said, how did they get the technology? Well, the short answer is they stole it, but they had pretty good scientists that they had kidnapped from Germany and forced into this program. And they made a crash effort to do it. And they had the bomb now too. So we no longer had a monopoly. It lasted four years. So this had to totally change our strategic calculations, right? Because before it was, well, they have the army and we have the bomb. So we're going to deter them with this bomb. Well, now they have it. So we know that if we drop a bomb on Moscow, they're going to retaliate by dropping one on Paris, probably, or London. So are we actually going to use this bomb? You know, the bomb is not very flexible. You either drop a nuclear weapon or you don't. There's no in between. There's no like, you know it's a blunt instrument, it's a sledgehammer, it's not a scalpel. And so many people started saying, maybe we need a huge conventional military buildup, like actual tanks and planes and like regular conventional weapons in Europe, which would be hugely expensive, but it would give us more options in case the Russians ever did invade Western Europe. A few months later, the communists took over China, which just stunned America and stunned the world. Now, China had had problems for a long time, right? Going all the way back to uh, the uh, Boxer Revolt and, and the US you know, invading and putting down that rebellion. In 1911, they had a revolution in China. The monarchy finally ended and they became a republic. But this, like so many revolutions, descended into a civil war where some revolutionaries wanted a communist regime and others wanted a you know, kind of a somewhat democratic or maybe a right-wing regime. And all through World War II, these two factions fought each other, right? The Japanese had invaded China in 1937, and all during this fighting, Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the nationalists, and Mao Zedong, the head of the uh, communists, just fought each other while they should have been fighting the Japanese. Once the Japanese withdrew, the civil war resumed in earnest, and finally the communists won. Now, um, the conservatives in America imagined that this was because uh, of some international conspiracy and, and from sabotage within, meaning that this was because the State Department allowed it to happen, meaning that there's actual communist spies, Soviet spies in the State Department who wanted this to happen and covered up how bad the situation was in China so that this could happen. There becomes this refrain, that Truman, quote, lost China, which is a weird phrase. I've always found that hilarious that we lost China. Like it's a set of car keys. It's a, it's a country of a billion people. How can you lose it? By the way, it was not ours to lose. Our soldiers are not there on the ground fighting. We gave Chiang Kai-shek plenty of money and weapons and he squandered it. He was corrupt. He didn't care about saving his country from communism. He spent millions and millions of dollars of this money that we gave him to defend his country from communism. And he pocketed it. He had wonderful bank accounts and palaces and furs and wonderful things that he gave to his wife. And so the nationalists lost the civil war and the communists won it, but it was earth shattering. Remember that just a few years before China was our ally, our valiant ally against Japan. Now we had rebuilt Japan into a democracy. And now China switched sides and it was a huge shock and everybody was pointing fingers. In fact, this senator that heretofore nobody had heard of him outside of Wisconsin, his name was Joseph McCarthy, and he gave a speech to a women's club in Wisconsin where he said that there are traitors in the State Department. There are 57 known communists in the State Department that the FBI um, is aware of the State Department knows that they're not firing them and they gave away China. And this hit like a thunderbolt because people were much more naive in the 50s. They couldn't imagine a US senator would be lying or exaggerating. He was lying and exaggerating. 
And there's a rule in the constitution that says that you are immune from anything you might say on the floor of the Congress, because you need to be able to have free debate and not afraid of anything. Um, now we have freedom of speech for citizens anyway, but you can be sued for libel and slander for saying something that's false and defamatory, but you have a 100% immunity if you're on the floor of the House or Senate. You can lie about anybody and say anything. And so this is why sometimes Congress people do. And McCarthy really did. He just came up with these ridiculous stories about communist spies everywhere and people ate it up. The press was just going insane with this. Um, and so this is sort of a, a we already had a Red Scare going on with HUAC in 1948, you know, interrogating Hollywood, which was ridiculous, but it would continue on into the 50s and Joseph McCarthy would pick up the mantle and he would be the leader, almost like a latter day Robespierre, right? There's just no guillotine here. We're not executing people, but we're just ruining people's lives by on national TV calling them communists without any evidence and then ruining them. Like they wouldn't be killed, but no one would hire them. No one would befriend them and they would just be ostracized from their community and lose everything. And this is what he did. He just went around you know, labeling people, no evidence really. Um, and again, uh, the FBI was actually finding actual communists in the government and quietly prosecuting them. McCarthy was grandstanding and found not an actual single spy, but what he found was a lot of you know left-wingers, basically. People and organizations that were very, very liberal and were calling for today things that we would say, yeah, like total integration of the schools in America tomorrow. And that sounded insane in 1950. Doesn't sound insane to us today, but at the time it just said, oh, the communists are trying to stir up racial hatred in America and look at these people, right? So. McCarthy, not a very nice guy and did a lot of damage to this country for four years. This is what he did from 50 to 54. He just was smearing people as communists and everyone was terrified of him because he would then, if you ever challenged him, he would turn that vitriol and hatred towards you and the press would just destroy you. And then we had Korea. So let's talk about Korea a bit which Korea has just come up a lot, right? Last year, uh, Parasite won Best Picture. Um, K-pop is this huge thing, you know? I don't know if you guys are in BTS uh, or I forget what the female band is called. Are they black, black pink or pink black? I don't know, my wife loves it. My wife loves K-dramas. She's just absolutely infatuated. Not just the Korean ones, but she likes the ones out of Hong Kong and, and Taiwan and Japan as well. Korea is very much penetrated the American consciousness. When I was a kid, we were ignorant of most other countries. I find it interesting. This is a global era where a lot of you guys are like watching stuff in other countries dubbed into, you know, uh, into English and, and enjoying it and loving it and appreciating, it, which is great. When I was a kid, uh, Korea was a very poor country in the 80s. They had the 88 Olympics. I still remember this. My next door neighbor, his father was an engineer, a nuclear engineer. So he went to Korea to help build all these power plants they were going to need for the Olympics in 88. So they left in like 86 or 87, left for like two years and then came back. And I remember asking, what's Korea like? They said, it's a very poor country. Uh, most of the people work at American shoe factories like Nike and Reebok, right? Like this is how Vietnam and uh, China are today is that they have these kind of sweatshop factories where people work for very little money making American shoes and toys and stuff. Today, South Korea is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, right? I mean, I remember as a kid, we used to make fun of Iowa, right? Nobody would buy an Iowa stereo, you buy Sony or General Electric uh, or Samsung, right? Nobody would buy a Samsung, you know, 30 years ago. It was a joke. They were just horrible quality. I got to tell you today, most of the appliances in my home are Samsung, not my phone, but my washer dryer is Samsung, my television is, my refrigerator is. They're great products. Korea's really had a quantum leap into the into the 21st century and is doing very well. They have a longer life expectancy than us. Uh, we live to be 78, they live to be 82. So they're very well off. Uh, North Korea is a totally different story. Uh, here's why they d diverged. Uh, much like Germany at the end of World War II, Korea became divided by a joint occupation. US soldiers landed in the South of Korea and moved up to the North. Soviet soldiers moved in from the north to the south, and we met to have a ceasefire at the 38th parallel. We had to capture all of these Japanese soldiers in mainland Asia and then ship them all back to Japan. And this, of course, like in every other country, this created a power vacuum. What is going to happen with Korea? We, of course, wanted them unified 
uh, rearmed, thriving democracy allied to us, the Soviets wanted to just install a communist dictatorship. And so after a few years, just like what happened in Germany, we just said, you do what you want in your zone, we'll do what we want in ours. The Soviets hand picked a, uh, a man that was educated in the Soviet Union, hardcore communist named Kim Il-sung. And he would be the beginning of this dynasty. There have been only three rulers in Korea for the last 71 years. And that's been Kim Il-sung, the grandfather, Kim Jong-il, uh, the, uh, the son, and then the grandson would be the current dictator of North Korea, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, the Kim dynasty, right? Or as I call him, Lil' Kim, right? Get it? Because he's short. I don't know if that joke's funny anymore because Lil' Kim hasn't made a record in a long time, but you know, she used to be the old Cardi B before there was Cardi B, right? God, I'm so embarrassed that I know that. Okay, so um, the U.S. installed uh, I, I hesitate to say, you know, a, a person that was pro-democracy, but certainly anti-communist na named Chairman Rhee, Singman Rhee. We installed him in the South. We wanted private enterprise business, et cetera. But as much as the limitations of Singman Rhee and as, as undemocratic as he was, far better than his communist counterpart in North Korea. And today, Korea is a thriving uh, democracy with freedom, equality, and equal rights and, and all the rest of it. North Korea is the least free place in the world. so. A lot of times, you know, we can criticize what the U.S. did in, in the Cold War, but at the end of the day, I do have to believe we were the good guys and they were the bad guys. Just look at the, the perfect laboratory experiment. You have a group of people that are the same ethnicity, the same culture, the same everything, and in one zone you have one government, and another one you have another one, and look at them today. And I would stake my reputation behind what the United States was able to achieve in rebuilding South Korea. So here's why the war happened. The country was divided. There was intense nationalism. Of course, people dreamed of reunifying Korea. Remember, Korea had been a, a colony for a long time. Japan had been in there since 1905. And before that, they were occupied by the Russians. And so many people wanted them to be re reunified, but under one system or the other. So Kim Jong, uh, uh, sorry, Kim Il-sung, got immense military aid from Stalin and rolled the tanks over the border in September of 1950 and tried just a conventional invasion of the South to just reunify it under communist rule. Caught the US totally by surprise. Most uh, diplomats and, and security officers felt that Asia was a sideshow. This was one of the poorest countries of the world. Europe, that's where everything, that's the center of the world because it's where the Soviets and Americans are staring each other down. If there's gonna be World War III, it's gonna be over Berlin or East West Germany. Nobody was paying attention to Korea. And this is exactly where the action happened. And Truman hesitated for a while. He did not know what to do. When he finally snapped into action, he made an error. He did not handle this in the, in the best way he could have. He should have gone to the Congress and he didn't. He went to the UN and the Security Council at the UN voted unanimously to use force and to, to intervene here. And that's what he did. Now, Truman's interpretation was, well, when we founded the United Nations, we surrendered some of our sovereignty to it. Yes, the US Congress can declare war and the, and the US would be obligated to then go and fight that war, but so can the United Nations. No one holds this interpretation today, but Truman just did it. He didn't even go to the Congress or even tell them, he just sent the army. Now, we kind of forgive him in retrospect because this was an important war, but just to preserve, you know, he would have gotten a vote authorizing it anyway, he should have just done it, but he didn't. By November of 1950, North Korea had pushed down the forces of South Korea to this tiny little enclave around the coastal city of Pusan, which was, everything was being evacuated to go to Japan at that point. Soldiers, equipment, everything was, everybody thought that the fall of South Korea was imminent. At that very moment, Douglas MacArthur, out of retirement, 75 years old, uh, launched an amphibious landing at Incheon, right west of Seoul, where he then took the communist forces from the back and then rolled the troops into North Korea. Now, before he did this, he did have to meet with Truman, get an authorization. And, and it was unclear exactly what are our goals, right? North Korea has invaded South Korea. Are we just in, evicting them from South Korea? Or do we take advantage of the fact that the war's already begun and try to invade North Korea and impose a democratic system on them? MacArthur met with Truman, told him, I think we should do this. Truman was very concerned about China. Like what would China do? Because as American forces are rolling up on the border here, the Yalu River, 
would China know our intentions? Would they feel threatened? Do they want to have a border between a pro-US government and, uh, and themselves? And MacArthur says, you know what? They're, they're severely weakened from their civil war. They're impoverished and they're cowards. They're, their government's not going to do anything. So Truman said, all right, you're wise in these matters. Go ahead and do it. This is a classic example of how sometimes people just have good common sense like Harry Truman and a high school diploma and other people can have been to uh, West Point, the military academy, fought in World War I and World War II and still be an idiot. Okay, And I know that's blasphemy to a lot of people. Some people have deified MacArthur. He was a genius in terms of military strategy, but he did not understand politics very well. And he had some, I would say, kind of fascist tendencies. Remember the bonus army where he gassed little babies because they were camped out on the White House lawn? Yeah, that was him too, right? So. Uh, MacArthur rolls over the border. American forces get all the way to this blue line by November of 1950. Um, and they were just 10 miles from the Chinese border. They paused to have uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Had all, you know, cranberry sauce and stuffing and turkey and everything else. And everybody said, by Christmas, the war will be over and we'll be home. And they were so wrong. The next day, the day after Thanksgiving, a million Chinese soldiers crossed the Yalu River and pushed American and allied forces back down to the 38th parallel, to the division line. No one expected this and all hell is gonna break loose in the, in the Korean Peninsula because the Chinese had a very uh, weak army. Uh, one would say they didn't have very conventional weapons uh, or very good ones. But what they made up for in quality, they they uh, or what they lacked in quality, they made up for in quantity. It's the largest country in the world. They had much larger army at this time than we did. A draft was implemented in Korea to kind of fill the gaps, but this was a much smaller war and Truman wanted to keep it small than World War II. The front lines would then seesaw back and forth for the next couple of years uh, and the war would drag on and no one would be able to find a way out. Now, MacArthur claimed he had a way out. What he did was he went to Truman and said, we need to use all the force of, uh, at our disposal. We need to use nuclear weapons. By this point, we had about 200 nuclear weapons. Soviets had a few too, not as much as us, but they had about a dozen or so. And so MacArthur wanted a seaborne invasion. Chiang Kai-shek had fled to Taiwan. He said, let's arm Chiang Kai-shek, have him land on mainland China and fight. And then let's blanket other parts of China with nuclear weapons and uh, dropping and nuclear explosions on them until they surrender. Truman was just shocked by this and horrified. And he said, maybe you don't quite understand this, but that would be World War III. If the Soviets would intervene, they would retaliate by probably moving on Berlin. What are you going to do then, Mr. MacArthur? And Douglas MacArthur said, don't you worry, they're cowards, they're weak from World War II, et cetera. And Truman's like, isn't that what you just said about China? Like you clearly don't understand anything about politics. So Truman shut this idea down, which was truly insane. MacArthur then went on radio and called the president a coward, uh, said that he had no sense, said that he was foolish, said that he was a communist stooge, basically. Uh, and you can't do this to your commander in chief. Whatever you might think of the president, uh, the president is democratically elected. Generals are not generals. Take their marching orders from the civilian government in this country. And you can't do that. So Truman fired MacArthur in April of 1950. Amazingly, or 1951, I should say, amazingly, Truman's popularity plummeted, went down to 23%, which is about as low as it gets. There's only been three presidents that have had approval ratings that low. Truman, when he left office, Carter, when he left office, and Nixon, when he left office which basically tells you no matter what you do, a quarter of the American public will still like you and support you. Um, but kind of shocking. Of all those three, you would say, well, Carter was dealing with the failed economy and a hostage crisis. Uh, um, George W. Bush, when he left office, was dealing with a, an economic collapse. Uh, uh, and uh, sorry, I forgot to mention him. He had a 23% approval rating too when he left. He was dealing with a collapsed economy and a, a war in Iraq that just wouldn't end. Um, Nixon had disgraced himself over Watergate. Only really Truman do we look back and say, the public had it wrong. He was a good president, even a great president that just was misunderstood. Americans sided with MacArthur because they did not understand 
excuse me, but half-assing it through this war. Like, you mean we're going to fight a war and not use as much force as we possibly could? Let's get in and get out. Get the war done with and come home. Truman said, no, what we're going to do is fight a conventional war in the Korean Peninsula, limited because we want to save precious American lives and prevent World War III. Truman was right. Americans do not like patience. And they don't like ties either. They don't like fighting to have a draw like they do in soccer, which I think is one of these reasons why soccer still is not that popular in America. A zero to zero tie after two hours, what was the point of that, right? We like it where you have a winner and a loser, right? You want that agony of defeat and the, the ecstasy of victory. You, Americans love that kind of stuff. We don't like a tie. We don't like the War of 1812 and we don't like Korea. These are the forgotten wars. The new general that gets in there, um, uh, Matthew Ridgway is going to fight along Truman's lines uh, and by the way, Ridgway gets like no credit to me. He was as good a general as MacArthur, if not better, and much more politically savvy. And he gets no credit. Everybody idolizes MacArthur. Um, in any case, uh, this war is prosecuted through 51 and 52. In come the Republicans and they sense weakness and they got it right. They realized the Democrats were toast over uh, over Korea, that they just could not win this war and Americans did not like that. And the Republicans were genius by nominating Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, he had a three word slogan, I like Ike. I still to this day do not know if Ike is a nickname for Dwight or for Eisenhower, but it doesn't really matter. This was on his you know, buttons, on his pins. Eisenhower um, uh, was a general and he had this slogan where people would ask him, you know, what are you going to do? And he, he said, I shall go to Korea, which is a wonderful slogan that says everything and nothing at the same time. What it implies is, hey, I'm the guy that beat Hitler and the Nazis. I'm going to go to Korea and whoop some butt, right? Uh, just send me over there, unleash me. Now, he doesn't say that when he says, I shall go to Korea. All he's saying is, I shall go to Korea. Like, I'll take a plane there, I'll land, and then I'll come home but people thought he was gonna kick butt and take names. He would not, he would get elected, he'd take office in January of 53, and in six months time, he would negotiate and leave. <clears throat> what really helped for the peace was that Stalin died in March of 53, and the new leadership under Khrushchev said, we don't want this war. This could easily escalate into a much bigger conflict and that does not serve our interests, so let's make peace. And so peace was made and the US got out. And still to this day, we have very bad relations with Korea. They're trying to expand their nuclear arsenal. Now they do have nuclear weapons, but they have no way to deliver it to the United States. Their rockets aren't quite there yet, but this is why they're constantly testing them. And then we get mad and tell them don't, and then we negotiate and they'll stop for a year or two and then they just resume. This is the game that we've been playing with them. We hope that that regime collapses at some point, but we're still stuck with it. Thank you very much, Stalin and the Soviet Union, right? This is the seed they planted way back then that's still this toxic uh, weed that's strangulating <laughs> uh, Eastern Asia and, and dealing with all these problems. But nonetheless, Korea ends. Americans are very happy to just see that go you know, by the wayside, and they're ready for the economic boom of the 50s and settling down but still ready to be on this crusade to fight communism throughout the world. Um, the home front was gonna get ready for this too. There was this huge case that I mentioned before, the Rosenbergs, that blew up in the early 50s. Now, they had been doing this years before and the FBI was investigating, but the trial was held in the early 50s. And it was um, a sensational trial, it lasted over a year. It was this couple, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, they worked on the Manhattan Project. They were physicists that helped build the nuclear bomb. And their, uh, Ethel's brother had dinner with him one night and kind of had this weird fishy sense about them, saw suspicious things and started going through their possessions and found these bizarre documents written in Russian, got very worried and then took the documents to the FBI and the FBI looked at it. Now with the documents, once they're translated, they're very nebulous. They don't say, hey, wink, wink, thanks for the secrets. Here's your money. Thanks for betraying your country. It, it wasn't like that at all, but it seemed very odd that there was a connection between the Russian government and them. Did they give them the secrets? They had no smoking gun or proof, but it didn't matter. The hysteria was at an all time high and the jury was willing to believe almost anything. Now, liberals all lined up behind the Rosenbergs because they said the evidence is minimal. They might very well be guilty, but you can't really prove it. 
And it didn't help that this was a Jewish couple and Jews had been persecuted throughout the world. And we had just gotten out of this war where Jews suffered more than anyone and were the victims of the Holocaust. Um, Jews had been you know, persecuted in, in America, the, the Dreyfus affair in, in France. Uh, and so this just left an unpleasant taste in everyone's mouth. And I get it, right? This is the liberals dilemma. Um, I've known liberals who are uh, reticent to attack any person of color and any minority, even when they're saying, you know, really, really bad things. Um, because this is a group that's had, you know, historic discrimination against them. And so liberals are kind of reticent to, to come in and, and, you know, even when people are doing bad things, if they're from a certain ethnic group, right? So liberals just thought we're just persecuting these people because they're Jews and they're they're liberal and they had joined left wing organizations before, but there's no actual evidence. When the Soviet Union collapses, we have a lot of questions. Um, one of them was, were the Rosenbergs guilty? When they released the, the archives, it turns out, yes, indeed, they were. Another one, which I guess I totally glossed over, shoot, I'm realizing that now, was Alger Hiss. Let's go back to that real quick. Sorry, we're going to rewind to 48 here. Um, Alger Hiss was a guy who was accused of being a communist by HUAC in 1948. This is academia, right? He was a college professor at Harvard. He had worked in the State Department. He was a top aide to Franklin Roosevelt at Yalta. And there was a gentleman by the name of Whitaker Chambers who was testifying to HUAC and said, I was a communist in the 30s. I, I was part of the spy organization. And here were all the members. And one of them they named was Alger Hiss. And that was just like a bombshell because he was a well-known academic Harvard professor, aide to FDR. And it was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? We got to interrogate this guy. So they bring Alger Hiss up to, to the committee. They start questioning him. Uh, and who really became the star of this was a uh, Californian representative from Orange County, from Yorba Linda, California, by the name of Richard Nixon. Nixon was fantastic on television. There's this weird myth that Nixon was terrible on television. Once he was bad in 1960 with his debates with JFK. Yeah, Kennedy was handsome, looked great. Nixon looked sick and you know had his five o'clock shadow on and everything. So he didn't look very good and he was bad in that moment, but he was wonderful in 1948. He grilled Alger Hiss, caught him in lie after lie. Now they were never able to prove that Hiss was a communist or a spy, but they were able to prove that he had lied to the committee because they asked him point blank. Were you a communist? No. And then they said, do you know Whitaker Chambers and were you friends with him? And he denied ever knowing him. They were able to prove that was false. In this weird situation where Hiss says, I have the evidence that Chambers and I, uh, or uh, Chambers says, I have the evidence Hiss and I knew each other. And I keep the evidence where I keep all my important documents. It's in a hollowed out pumpkin in my pumpkin patch in Maryland, which is just bizarre. Like, wouldn't you have it in a safe or anything? You had a little microfilm, you know? Uh, before they had miniaturization or digitization of, of information, they used to kind of miniaturize it. You'd have it on film that you would put on a projector and blow up on a big screen. So you could condense files. They wouldn't be these big pages. It would be this tiny little thing. Like a, a, the New York Times for the whole year would be just on a little roll of film. And on this was all these documents, correspondence and evidence that Chambers and Hiss knew each other. Hiss is then prosecuted in a criminal trial for perjury for lying under oath. He goes to prison for several years, but when he is let out in the mid 50s, he asserts his innocence and he says, Richard Nixon just smeared me, ruined my career. He was just another Joe McCarthy. Turns out that was not true either. Again, every all the historians run to the Russian archives when the Soviet Union collapses in 89 and says, was Alger Hiss an actual spy? Turns out he was. And people had kind of lined up on either side of that for a long time. He was actually a spy. So there were spies, but McCarthy wasn't finding them. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI were, but McCarthy wasn't. Um, and Nixon was catching people in lies, but you know he didn't actually catch his. But he drew attention to him. He put a spotlight on him, nonetheless. So um, last thing I'll just lead you, leave you with was that there was this big push on the home front to prepare for uh, this Cold War. We had to educate the population. And so um, cartoons were made. Uh, one of my favorites is Bert the Turtle, right? Uh, where by the 50s, we had nuclear weapons, the Soviets had nuclear weapons. We now had intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles, so did they. They had submarines that could launch nukes, and so did we. So it's really terrifying. A Soviet submarine, there's no way to stop it. It could surface 
a hundred miles off the coast of New York and obliterated in a heartbeat. And there would be nothing we could do other than to retaliate to them and do the same thing. And so the civilians were told, and when I was a kid in the eighties, we still did this. And it's amazing to me. We would do duck and cover drills, not just for earthquakes, but for nuclear war drills. They, and they would educate us that when the bomb comes, there'll be a big flash wherever you are, just duck and cover like Bert the turtle and your shell, you know, will keep you safe, which was insane, but I get it. I have a kid. And when we sent them off to preschool for the first time, uh, they wanted us to have like this, you know, uh, get like the water and granola bars and you know nuts and dried fruit and stuff like that but also like a picture of the family together because when kids are dealing with a big crisis like an earthquake or something like that you want to show them a picture of their family so that they get oh mom and dad are okay and they're going to come and get me and it's heartbreaking but this is there's actually good child psychology on this that it's good to actually talk to kids about this and even lie to them and say it'll be okay if there's a nuclear war and that was a complete lie there was no defense there's still no defense uh, if the North Koreans were able to make a, a missile that could reach the West Coast, there is nothing we could do to stop it other than to retaliate and hope that deterrence would prevent them from doing it in the first place. Um, this is where the Pledge of Allegiance comes about. A lot of people think the Pledge of Allegiance is this ancient thing going back. No, it started in 1956. And the pledge was changed uh, to insert the words under God. It used to be one nation indivisible, and they changed it under God because the Soviets were explicitly atheists and we wanted to say, we have God on our side and God's blessed our democracy. There was this great article that Life Magazine wrote that was entitled, Why Johnny Can't Read and Why Ivan Can. And the thesis was essentially that our kids were frivolous. All they care about is rock and roll music, putting pomade in their hair, dancing at the sock hop with Susie on a Friday night. Soviets, uh, high schoolers like, you know, like Ivan, they're working 16 hours a day in the chemistry lab and that's why they're gonna beat us. So we need to invest in science, right? There's this wonderful Jake Gyllenhaal movie, uh, October Sky, and it's about this poor kid from West Virginia who's 18 generations of coal miners. He's poor, his family's never been to college, but he's smart. And he got these NASA scholarships to go study physics and chemistry, and he got into the NASA program, right? And so um, this was the National Defense Education Invest so that young kids will wanna study science and not just study the easy subjects, right? Like communications, no offense, but that's the you know, major that a lot of people do when they're not sure what they wanna do. Okay, that's it. I'm done with the Cold War, with the origins of it. We'll pick up there next time. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Have a good one.